Okay, welcome everyone. Bruchim Babayim. Thank you for coming out. So um, it's that time of year again. We have a Jewish holiday that no one understands, no one knows how to celebrate, and most people don't know the reasons behind it, and I'm not going to be telling you what this holiday is about. I'll leave that to the next rabbi who's going to speak, but I will share one aspect of it. I don't know what the name of the holiday is. Tu Ba'av, which means... Very good. 15th day of the month of Av. It's interesting because Av has within it the 9th of Av, which we just passed, which is the worst day in the Jewish calendar with some of the worst uh, atrocities that were done against our people. And then a few days later, on the 15th, suddenly we get to a day that is considered to be the best day in the Jewish year. Up there, it's going to sound like a strange comparison, you'll see in a moment, with Yom Kippur. That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says that Tu Ba'av was the happiest day of the Jewish year as Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur and Tu Ba'av were two of the days that the Jewish people felt so happy, so relieved. Why would that be? So I think the answer is because they were both new beginnings. You see, Yom Kippur, although you may think it's a sad day because you're not eating, but it's actually a very happy day because all of your averot, all of your sins for the entire year are being wiped away. So it's a new beginning for you. But there was another new beginning. And that new beginning was for a tribe, for a shevet called Binyamin. And this tribe had done something terrible at one point of history, treated a certain woman in a place called Giva, very, very inappropriately in a very terrible way. And all the other tribes made a shavu, an oath, that they would not marry into the tribe of Binyamin. And this carried on for a long time. And you can imagine that when one shevet of Israel, one tribe is now excluded from marrying into all the other tribes, because of a mistake that they made, and it was a terrible mistake, and they make a shvua, an oath, not to marry into this tribe, we're going to have a shidduch problem. If you think the shidduch problem is bad now, it was really bad for Shevet bin Yom. And it got to a point where they realized that if they didn't allow their sons and daughters to marry into bin Yamin, <laughs> end of Shevet. We're going to lose one of Shvatim of Yisrael. And so they made a decree and said, although we made an oath that you cannot marry into Sheva bin Yamin, that was only applicable for the generation that the oath was made. But the next generation, and the one after that, they said, we're going to let you do it. And so they did something unbelievable. They made a party. Now, the description of the party sounds pretty crazy, but they had the women go out into the fields, and the women would wear white, Actually, they, bought, they wore borrowed clothing. So nobody knew what kind of family they came from, right? Because usually people come from rich families, wear very nice clothing. People who come from lesser families wear lesser clothing. And here they made a decree that everyone was going to dress differently. So you had no idea of the yichus, of the genealogy and the financial backing of any one person. They did it. And they went out, and they pretty much made a shidduch event. And everyone wore white. We we're actually going to... I see some white, actually. Is that coincidentally people are wearing white? Is that a coincidence over here? Akiva, you planned this whole white thing? Yeah, whatever. That's what they did. They made this white event for everyone. White represents purity. White represents a clean slate. And so white was the color for two ba'av. I'll give you a little Kabbalistic understanding of this. The rabbis say that every month is given either a good energy or a bad energy. And each month was given to B'nai Yaakov, which is a good energy, or B'nai Esav, a bad energy. Esav, however, and Yaakov had a bit of a dispute. Who should get Av? So Av is, as far as I know, the only month that was split down the middle according to Kabbalah, the first half which we're now coming to the end of, because tomorrow night is, tish- is Tubav, the first half was given to Bnei Esav, and was given a negative 
challenging time, which is why from the beginning of Av till the ninth of Av we have the nine days, right, which finish the three weeks, Ben Abitzarim, the very difficult time um, into Tisha B'Av. The second half of the month belongs to Yaakov, to Jacob. That means it's got a spiritual purity and cleanliness. And so maybe that is a Kabbalistic understanding. Well, now we're about to begin a very positive, happy time. That's where we are. And this is a time they say for Suguna. Now, we don't, we don't do anything nowadays between you and me. Okay, in Israel, they call it the Jewish Valentine's Day. This is complete nonsense. The only thing we do today is we don't say Tachanun, right? We don't... Um, say Tachanun, we don't repent during that time. And so there's a positive energy that comes with the day itself. However, make no mistake, if this became a time of the Jewish calendar for goodness and for simcha, and it was back then, and it has been ever since, it's probably a good day to pray for something. And if you're going to pray for anything, and if you're single, and if you don't want to be single, probably a good time to pray for a shidduch. So, those who know me know that I speak a lot about relationships and dating, and I wrote a book on it. Those who anyone knows called uh, Will You Marry Me, which was a follow-up to my first book, Do you Got Questions. And basically, I put the book together because I spent many, many, many years doing weddings. Actually, I just did a wedding on Sunday, which was a very, very small wedding. I don't think anyone here is going to have a wedding as small as this. There were maybe, I'm going around the table, 17, 18 people. We barely had a minyan. I almost had to include the caterer, who's a friend of mine and a complete mishugana, so thank God we didn't. But um, we managed to make a minyan. Why would it be such a small? I did actually once a wedding of that size, actually, many years ago, I should tell you. A, a girl approached me and she said, Rabbi, I'm getting married. She said, is it okay if I have pizza at my wedding? I was like, why would you have pizza at your wedding? And she said, because we can't afford anything else. We're both students, and we want to get married, and so we're going to have pizza at the wedding. You know? So I said, well, I mean, theoretically you can, but it's pretty sad, right, to have pizza at a wedding. Why don't you have a little bit more lavish and some more people? And she says, no, we don't have any friends here. They were both from abroad and uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, she said, I wanted to end. So what we did was, I actually mentioned this in a shi'or, and I said, there's this couple of us to get married, and we um, need to raise funds for them, you know? And someone said, well, you know, isn't it better if we just, like, made food for them? So this is a true story, by the way. It actually made the papers local papers anyway. And one person said, I'll make the rice. Another said, I'll make the chicken. And someone said, I will, um, I will do the lighting for free. There was a man there who heard this who said, actually his daughter was at the shiur, and she said, my father works in jewelry. He will donate a ring. It wasn't a big diamond, but it didn't have to be. And he donated a ring uh, for the, for the uh, chuppah ceremony. And the band donated their time. And I donated my time, which I don't do anymore. And uh, actually, I just did, by the way. It's a joke. I completely just did. And the whole wedding was actually, every guest of that wedding, I should mention, it came to my head, I thought I'd mention it, was people who donated towards the wedding. Isn't that correct? Pretty much, they didn't even know the Chatan and Kala. And we did it at uh, Fifth Avenue Synagogue, right here, one street down from where we are right now. It was a very, very touching and, uh, and uh, moving experience. So that was a small wedding. Uh, but I did an even smaller wedding this past Sunday because both the Chatan and Kala, um, who I know the Chatan very well, it's a close friend of mine, had both been married twice before. Understand that? This is their third wedding on both sides. So, I mean, they had children there and grandchildren there. And, you know, it takes a lot for me to get emotional under a chuppah, you know? Just like the, it's rare the doctor starts crying when, you know, the baby comes out, the nurse. They just come do the job and get out, you know? It's a little bit for me. I feel, I feel something and I feel nice. It's a tremendous thing. But here, I actually, um, I, got, I got emotional. And afterwards, the color said something which was not nice. 
she said that she was finishing off her second marriage and she said that, and she was talking, you know, privately among us, and she said that a rabbi had told her, or said it was a rabbi, and told her, and she was crying when she was saying this, that, that set me off as well. The rabbi told her, don't get divorced a second time. Who's ever going to want a girl who's divorced twice, let alone once? You know, and she said she felt so bad. And she goes, here I am, and I proved him absolutely wrong. Baruch Hashem. So it was a very, very uplifting uh, experience and time. I got a lot to say, and we can just basically ask questions if you want, because all of you are dating, and some of you are professional daters like I was for many, many years. But, um, you know, I like to choose something that's topical right now in the Jewish world. So anyone see this Netflix show? The, um, give me that, I keep forgotten the name, I apologize. The Jewish Matchmaker. So I was expecting a train wreck, because whenever Jewish people are represented, you know, on you know, Netflix and other places, it doesn't look good. But I was actually pleasantly surprised with the parts that I, I saw. I think she did a fantastic job, and I think she made a tremendous Kiddush Hashem, and I think that, you know, smiling and laughing through it was the right way to go, because it can be very, very difficult. As you people know, I'm sure, those people who are dating, hopefully, to get married. But this idea of a Shad Khan, let's just talk about that for a few moments. What is this concept? Why do we even have a Shad Khan? Is that a new concept? Is that an old concept? Is paying for a Shad Khan a Jewish tradition? Is that something we should be doing at all? Maybe we should all be, you know, using Shad Khanim or being a Shad Khan and not being paid for it. I was at a Pesach program with my family many years ago. I was a rabbi at this program. It's a true story. This program was in Florida, not the one I've been part of for the number, past five years, a different program. Actually, the year I was there was the last year that I'd ever had this program. Maybe the story will explain why. And the head of the program said, you know, we're going to have a panel at midnight tonight. It's a true story. And we want to be in the panel. And we have a male Shadchan, who was a very famous man, very famous in this world. And we have a female Shadchanit, and we want him to be the rabbi on the panel. So I was like, why not? Why shouldn't I be up on this panel? And it was midnight, and I was expecting maybe 20, 30 people. Packed! Literally hundreds of people. And I was a little surprised. And they put a table out, and they put me right in the middle. Right? Male shadchan to my right, female shadchan to my left, and me right in the middle. And I promise you, the head of the program stood up. He was a very, you know, straight man. And he says, welcome everyone to the World Wrestling Foundation Shadchan Discussion. I was like, what the heck was that? What was that about? And then I found out these people, many of them, were very upset. Understandably, although I'm not really appreciative of how the way they spoke to these two people, with what's happening in the world today, especially in the world of Shadchanut. Right? That they don't take care of us, that they don't give us the time, that they charge too much, and they do charge. You know, I paid my shadchan when I got married. I got married 23 years ago, and I gave my shadchan $500, which for me back then, first I had to split it with my wife, right? <laughs> she was working. I'd been in yeshiva for five years, so, you know, I had like no money. You know what I'm saying? Now I have debt, Baruch Hashem. But then I had no money, and Baruch Hashem, Right? And it was a fortune. And now, I mean, my, I, I'm now on the other side of the table. Now I've got daughters, Baruch Hashem Liyanua, in Shidduchim. And I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. And I, it's a challenging time. So what is the idea of Shad Chanut? Is this a Jewish concept? Is it people taking advantage of us? How far does this go back? Who was the first of a Shad Chan? Great question, right? Yeah. Very nice. I think you're absolutely right. The first Shad Khan, I think, this is my opinion, maybe some beforehand, but it probably was actually, but first human Shad Khan was Eliezer. You see, Eliezer was a servant of Avram Avinu. And he didn't become Jewish. And yet Avram Avinu entrusted him with the most unbelievable mission that is known to any Jewish family, which is to find a Shidduch for his son Yitzchak. Now, this wasn't just like a regular Shidduch situation, was it? 
I mean, whoever's going to marry Yitzhak is going to be the mother of the Jewish people. I mean, this is a really big deal. Wouldn't you think Avram Avinu himself would schlep out and go, hello, I'm Avram. By the way, let's be honest. Would Avram Avinu find a good shidduch right now? So who are you? I'm Avraham. Oh, really? Where are you from? From the community? Nah, from Ur Kastim, Haran. You know, that's why I kind of, aha. So you must come from a very prestigious family. You must have great genealogy, great yichus. Well, my father's actually in the um, Avodah Zara trade. He sold idols. If Aram Avinu, if Abraham came today and tried to find a shidduch for his kids and he walked into the average community, I'm sorry, you're telling me you want a shidduch for your kid and your father was an idol worshiper? Yeah, he made a lot of money doing it, but I smashed them. I don't know if many Jewish families would be very happy with the situation. Sad, pretty crazy. I don't know if Moshe Rabbeinu would find a great shidduch for his kids nowadays. Things have gone crazy. That everyone's going back, checking every situation. What are the parents, grandparents? I mean, I don't, we all do it. But maybe we're overdoing it. And so Avram Avinu has this decision. He's like, I've got to find a shidduch. And he could have gone because he was famous in his day and much beloved by many, many people. He had brought many souls back to Judaism. And now he's sending out Eliezer, who, by the way, he was not even going to become part of the Jewish people. He came from Canaan. He had no connection to... And by the way, he was upset about that. He wanted his own daughter for Yitzchak. Did you know that? And so he was going against his own nature. Eliezer wanted his daughter to marry Yitzchak. And he knew that that wasn't going to work because Avram wanted someone from his own family. And so he removed him and said, you cannot marry, but you can still find someone. Wow, can you imagine a Shadchan? Like, no, no, no. You can't go near my family, but find me someone who can. And he did it. Kachava, he went. And I, I like to mention this. He goes and he's told whereabouts to find someone for Avraham's son. And he's told the kind of character. But the final decision was actually his. Unless Yitzchak would actually reject, which he was entitled to do. Which he didn't. But he could have if he wanted to. That's the halakha. Anyway, the longest prayer we see in the Torah is the tefillah of Eliezer. I'll say that again. The longest printed prayer of someone praying in the Torah, and when you get to see the prayer line by line, is Eliezer praying to Hashem to find a shidduch for Yitzchak. It cannot be a coincidence, right? It can't be that the, we see the longest tefillah is written once and then written again twice. I mean, we learn halachot in Judaism from an extra word or an extra letter. And yet here we have all this sicha, all this conversation of Eliezer praying to Hashem. And we're given the full, not every prayer that's ever made by every person in Jewish history is printed in the Torah. It must be very, very important. But why do I need to know that? You may not need to know the contents of the prayer, although it's good to know it as well. But to know that Shiduchim and Tefillah are connected. But why did Avram send Eliezer anyway? Why didn't he go himself? It's a good question. I'm not sure. But I'd like to suggest, and maybe this is the root of Shiduchim, that parents are too nogeh bedavar. Just a little bit too much proximity to the situation. Now, I'm not saying that parents should not get involved in Shiduchim. I think today... There's definitely, in many cases, an over-involvement. And by the way, there's an interesting halakha. You do not need to get permission from your parents. This is halakha. You may not always... Some halakha you shouldn't always act out on, per se. But this is one of them. You shouldn't over have over control by your parents on who you marry. You're entitled to marry who you want. I mean, within the lines and confines of halakha. Right? But if your parents say, don't marry someone, you are actually entitled to marry that person, just so you know. It may not always be the best idea, but I know many situations where the parents are not so happy with their kids marrying a certain individual, and then they come around, sometimes within a few weeks, a few months, sometimes when the grandkids come, and they kind of back into it. But that's rare. Usually you want your parents 
on your side, at least tolerating the person you're going to marry. You're entitled to make your own mistakes. So many parents are too involved and they're too close to the situation. You need an outside voice. So I believe that's the situation of Eliezer. Eliezer was in trust because Avram may have felt it could be that once I get involved, no one's going to be good enough for my little Jewish boy. And he may have rejected any possibility. Like many Jewish mothers, no one's good enough for my little Jewish boy. Who can replace me? Who can replace my food? Who can replace my cholent, my choresh? It cannot be, right? You're never going to... And so sometimes you need to make a little distance, a healthy boundary is what I call it when you try to find someone else. I said that Eliezer is the first ever Shadchan, but really there's a Shadchan that comes before Eliezer. And who is that? Hashem. God is the ultimate Shadchan. And there's a very famous conversation in the Gemara between a rabbi called Rabbi Yossi ben Chalafta. Have you heard this story before? Yossi ben Chalafta was approached by a Roman dignitary. She's called a matron in the Gemara, and she approached him. She was a very wealthy and successful woman with many, many, many uh, slaves. And she approached Rabbi, and she says, Rabbi Yosef, what does Hashem do since he's done creation? What's, what's God doing? He created the world, now what's he doing? It's a strange question. I mean, assuming creation wasn't just a one-off event, and it's continually happening throughout history. But that was the question, and he came out with an even stranger answer. He said to her, He's been making shiduchim. He's been matching couples together. He started with Adam and Chava, and he's been doing it ever since that time. And she turns around to him and says, Have hey, you know the Gemara? I was like, Well, I could do that. You need God to make shiduchim? So this matron said to Rabbi Yosef Chalafta, I'll do the same. So she got all of her male slaves, this Roman dignitary, and all of her female slaves. And he says, you're going to marry him. And you're going to marry her. Right? It's like um, <laughs> another topic I want to speak about. Cults do this. Right? There was this um, cult, which may still be around, actually. I hope they don't assassinate me. Sun Myung Moon, the Moonies. You know this cult? That was a, that's a big, big cult. You can read about them. So they do these mass weddings. Have you seen, like, videos of these mass, like, literally like a thousand people marrying each other? So I saw a documentary recently, and they actually say that the head would be like, okay, you're going to marry her. And you have a few minutes to get to know each other, and then we'll see you tomorrow for the wedding. You can see this online. It's unbelievable. And there's thousands of people getting married. So that's exactly what they did. And she put them all together. However, not so successful. As you can imagine, the next day, each one of them turned up with big, big complaints. This one came with a missing ear. This came with a broken nose. This guy's leg was killing him, right? And she saw that they actually didn't want to stay married. And then she turned around and said, I get it. God is the ultimate Shadchan, which just, just strengthens our question. What is the point of a Shadchan? Should they be paid for what they do? You know, I'll open it up. What do you think? Do we need Shadchanim 2023-24? Is that something we want among the Jewish people? Jewish matchmakers? Are they entitled to charge for their services? There's a lot of silence. So I'll give you my opinion, but I'm sure you have your opinions. We need them. We need them badly. We need a third party to act as an interface. And by the way, not only should they be a matcher upper, they actually need to be a mentor. Someone you can go to and speak to and confide in. Someone who gets to know you intimately. Just approaching someone and say, could you set me up? All right, people say that to me. And I don't know who you are. You know, I'm like, I don't know. And I set people up and they're like, that's what you think of me? You set me up with a one-legged, headless like gorilla, right? Is that, that's what you set me up? That's what you think about me? Rabbi? Well, not exactly. But 
It's understandable. They get frustrated. You get to know someone. They need to understand you, appreciate you. That means you need to spend time with them. Now, in terms of time itself, there's a limited amount of shadchanim out there, and they need to be constantly reminded that you are single. They need to, you need to, you know, the expression, the squeaky wheel, you know? You know, I once did a um, <laughs> Shabbaton, and um, we were doing a Zmirat. It was a Zmirat, we were singing. And at the end I said, and God willing, you know, everyone here should find their Zivuk Hagun, their perfect match. And one girl from the back said, Amen! Like this. So my, my eyes went up, and I'm like, wow, she needs a Shidduch. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> this girl is in need of a, uh, of a marriage partner. And every time I talk to her, she's like, oh man, I mean, and you know what? I noticed her. And you know what? She stayed in my mind, you know? This loud screamer of uh, amen. She was in touch with me. A little time afterwards, by the way, I'm just letting you know right now, I'm a terrible, terrible matcher upper of Jewish people. Just so you know, I really, I'm just not very good. I'm great at counseling people, People meet through my programs. I once led a trip to Israel, and five couples met on that trip and got married. And I did all five chuppot. Baruch Hashem. But I just happened to be there. You know what I'm saying? I put the trip together. It wasn't really... Happened to be that one of my distant cousins called me up. He was in England. And says, I'm coming to America. Can you set me up with a girl? I was like, i got enough trouble here. i got to set you up too. I happened to be standing next to this girl, the one from the Screamer Outer, and she's sitting next to me. I'm like, are you single right now? She's like, yeah. I'm like, you want to go out with my cousin? She's like, I'm not living in London. I was like, no, no. He doesn't want to live in London. It's fine. He'll live here, which was a complete lie. His entire family were there. His job was there. He had no intention of leaving London to move to America, you know? And uh, I got on the phone. I said, listen, there's a girl there. She's, she's single. Right? And uh, I'm just so you know. And uh, he's like, is she willing to move to London? I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> You're crazy. She had no intention. She had a job. Her parents. Uh, no chance. Like, yeah, yeah, sure. What do I care? It's not my problem. They're going to have to get married, not me. So I set them up on a date. Right? I happened to know them both very well. It wasn't just like out of the blue. It wasn't just like your male, your female, and Shalom Ali Yisrael. There was something there. But um, similar personalities, 